All right, Luke chapter 6, pretty long chapter here. We see a lot of teaching here by Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be focusing in here, kind of starting around verse 20. And basically what he's doing, he's, he's teaching kind of on the spirit that we ought to have within ourselves. There's a certain way that we need to be behaving and a certain way we need to view the world, we need to view our worldly possessions, and we need to view other people. And some of the things that Jesus says here are maybe contrary to the wisdom of this world. They're definitely contrary to the wisdom of this world. He says things like, love your enemies. Right? That's not what the world is going to teach you. Sarah, sit down in your chair and don't get back up again. He teaches us things to love your enemies, to be good to those that hate you, to do all these good things. Let's start, let's start reading some of these. Verse number 20, we'll start reading again. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. So he's starting it off by giving them encouragement, saying, look, I know that you're poor. I know that you're hungry. I know that, that people are casting out your name as evil and don't want to have anything to do with you. But he's, he's saying, you're blessed. He's saying, you're blessed when all these things happen. He's like, don't let that bother you. Don't get distracted. Even though you may be hungry, even though you may be poor, don't get caught up and so concerned and worry about all these physical things that you think that you need in this lifetime. Because that is not what's important. And then he goes on to continue and say, look at verse number 24, but woe unto you that are rich. He's saying, look, if you, oh, you think you're rich, woe unto you. He says, for you have received your consolation. He said, you already got what's coming to you. You know, these people that are poor and doing the work of the Lord, hey, they're going to receive a blessing. They're going to get rewards up in heaven. But you that are rich, he's like, you've, you've got your reward. It's right here. This is what you've been working for. It's all right here. And that's the sadness because the things that we have in this world, they're going to be burned up. It's going to be gone. You can't take anything with you. You cannot take this physical, this world's goods with you. So that's a sadness. That's a woe unto you. He says, he continues on here, verse number um, 25. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. He, he's given here, this, this, um, this view that we, that we need to maintain because the world's going to tell you the exact opposite of everything he just said. You know, he's saying, hey, you're hungry now, you're blessed because you're going to be filled. You know, you're, you're poor now, be blessed because you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, all these things that, that people, the world's going to tell you, oh, these are bad things, you need to work to try to, to get out of these things. He said, no, that's good. And the exact opposite, you know, the people that are rich now, they have everything. People are just praising them and they have the fame and everyone tells them how wonderful they are. He's saying it's not all it's cracked up to be and we shouldn't be looking at that as being a good thing. It's actually not a good thing. Because he's like, when people speak well of you, they did the same thing with the false prophets. The people had a false message that weren't of God. Everybody loves that person. Everybody loves the Joel Osteen. Everyone loves those types of guys. But he says, you know, watch out for that. Woe unto you if that's you. Because if you're doing the work of Jesus, I mean, if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call him, them of his household? So if you're really following Christ, if you're doing and, and acting and being the way that Jesus was being, you are going to face all of these problems and these issues that the, his disciples were facing, that Jesus Christ himself faced. And have your name thrown down in the mud and cast out as evil. And, and, you know, you may be suffering from not having very much of this world's wealth and being hungry and, and other things because you're more focused on doing the work of our Father in heaven than just doing so much work to accumulate wealth in this world. Look at verse 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies... Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Now, I don't want to just gloss over this 
Because these are words that are easy to hear and really hard to do and to put into action. I mean, the Bible is saying here, love your enemies. I mean, who is an enemy? Someone who withstands you, someone who is opposing you, someone who, you know, doesn't want you to succeed. These are people that, that don't have, have, have well intentions for you. They're your enemies. And Jesus says, yeah, love those people. Because I'll tell you, your first reaction is going to be like, I hate those people. I hate these people that are getting in my way, trying to stop everything you do. Jesus says, love those people. He says, do good to them which hate you. you. Say, why? You know, this person hates me. They won't have anything to do with me. Yeah, do good unto them. Do good unto them. Bless them that curse you. People who are, who are saying all kinds of bad things, maybe they're bad-mouthing you, you say, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with that person because they're, they're always saying, you know, talking trash about me. Jesus said, bless them. Say good things to them. This is the attitude that, that he's saying that we need to have. I mean, it's, in, it's in black and white, or in, in my Bible, it's red and white, but you know, these are the words of Jesus. He's saying this to us. We need to be able to, to, to really let this sink in so that when people do you wrong, you don't have a bitter heart and a hateful attitude towards them. And it's hard to overcome that because that's our natural instinct and reaction when people will, will badmouth us and do all manner of evil against us. The first thought is not, how can I do something good for them and bless them? But this is what Jesus is saying that we need to do. He says, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. You say, you know, every time I do something for this person, I just feel like they're using me. I just feel like, you know, they're just taking advantage of me. And I just try to help them. And they're just using me. And they only call me up when they need something. Does the Bible say avoid them and don't have anything to do with them? No, it says pray for them. Pray for them. Keep them in your prayers. They have needs. Pray for them. Don't let your heart get bitter and angry against people who do these things to you. These people will exist. They'll exist inside the church. They'll exist outside of the church. This is the attitude that Jesus Christ, this is the spirit that he's telling us that we need to have towards these people. Verse 29, And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take away thy coat also. He's saying, look, someone comes and hits you in the face. So you just go and just start swinging back. And just, he says, no, go ahead. Hit the other side now. Go ahead. It's not bringing evil upon that person. You know, someone gets so mad at you for the things that you say, you don't need to fight. It's, our fight is not a physical fight. It's a spiritual battle. And he says, you know, someone's going to take your cloak, you know, take one of your coats. Says, well, give him your coat also. Go ahead, take it. Obviously, you need it more than I do. You know, the, the, the objective here is to, is to defeat evil with good. And we'll see that in a little while. We're going to turn to that. But look what he says in verse 30. He says, Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. He's teaching us to have a spirit here of, of, of being able to give to people that are in need. You know, give to people, hey, they ask you something and you have it. You know, you ought to be able to give to them. And people who take away thy goods, you know, people say, you know, don't even worry about it. Just go ahead and keep it. He says, don't even, don't even ask for them again. Because we don't need to be focused on those things and letting those little things worry us and bother us. And if someone has need for something, then give it to them. This is, this is all an attitude and a spirit that we need to have about us of regarding, notice, all of this stuff is, is kind of regarding material things and, and maybe possibly our own pride, right? When people do us wrong, it's either our pride that's being attacked or it's just the, 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 the things that we possess. And he's saying, don't worry about any of that stuff. Do good unto people. Look at what it says in verse 31. This is key. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. It's a golden rule, right? Whatever you want people, however you want to be treated, the way that you would like, in any dealings, and in any interactions that you have with other people, if you could think of how you would like them to treat you, Sarah, sit up and pay attention. The way that you would like them to treat you, that's how you're supposed to treat them. 
When you're down and out, when you're in need of something, when, when you're immobilized or when, when, you know, when, when things are going bad and you have a severe need or whatever, how would you want people to react to you? With how much love, with how much care, with how much effort do you want someone to put forth for you? And that's what he's saying. That's how you need to be towards them. You could say, oh, this person has a need, but they're, you know, I have to drive like an hour and a half away and it's so not convenient. I have to do all these things. And I, you know, it, whatever the case may be, I, I have so much to do. And I'm so busy and this is really inconvenient for me. Well, think about that person and what state that they're in. And then think about yourself. If I was in that position, wouldn't I want the person to come and help me because I have a, severe, I have a serious need? This is the way that he's telling us we need to be living our lives. It's, it's, a, it's a whole attitude and a mindset where you are literally putting other people above yourself. Because we all, let's be, we all have things to do. I mean, at least I know everybody here does. We're all very busy, right? I know, unfortunately, no one in our church that I know of here is like retired and just has absolutely nothing to do. We all have busy lives. We all have things going on. Anything that we would have to do for someone else is going to be inconvenient for us if we were just thinking about ourselves. Going out, helping someone out, maybe spending money on whatever, whatever the case may be. Say, well, we're struggling financially. I know. We all are. But when someone has a need, you know, we need to think, what would we like to receive ourselves and, and how would we like to be treated? Verse 32, for if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And he's saying, look, if you're only going to help your friends or your close friends or people that you know, well, they're always good to me, so I'm going to be good to them. He's saying, that's what the world does. That's no different than anybody else. Of course you're going to take care of the people that take care of you. The whole point of what he's getting across here is saying, look, you need to be this way to people who aren't that way to you. Because that's what Jesus was and that's who he was to us. We did wrong to him. We did wrong by sinning against God, yet he still loved us enough to come and very inconveniently shed his blood on the cross and burn in hell for three days and three nights and rise again from the dead to save us and to help us who were in need of a Savior. We are completely undeserving. We didn't do anything for Him. He had to come out of His way to help us. And this is the loving spirit and attitude we need to have towards everybody, towards these people who are even our enemies. You know, we need to be able to think, we're here as a, as a minister, as a servant. Sarah, sit up in your chair. Verse 34, and if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. He's saying even when you, when you lend your stuff out, we say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lend this out to somebody. He says, if you just lend and you, just, you, just, you expect to just get it right back again and, every, you know, and everything's there, that's what everybody does that lends. He's saying you need to be able to lend out your stuff and, and you know, expect not to get it back. And, and that should be just fine. And then, because you will get a thank for that. We'll get into that in just a minute here. Look at verse 35. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. I was saying, God, just as God is kind to the unthankful, he was kind to those, those ten lepers. Remember the, the lepers that Jesus Christ cleansed and only one of them returned to even say thank you? He was kind to the unthankful. They weren't thankful for being, for being cleansed of their disease. But he was still showed kindness and mercy unto them. He says the same way, you need to be able to love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And he says if you can do that, if you can have this type of an attitude, your reward's going to be great in heaven. Let go of the little things here in order to receive great reward of God by your spirit and your attitude of being able to do these things. 
Now, people will do you wrong and they'll disrespect you and they'll use you. They'll treat you poorly, especially as you start to try to do things and live a godly life and try to help people. And the more you get involved with people, the more you will see this happen. And it's going to happen. I know it's already happened with us and it'll, and it'll happen again. And it's just kind of the way that it goes when you get involved in doing ministry or serving other people. You'd like to think that people can all have the same attitude of humility and putting other people before you and would care about you as much as you care about them. But that's not the case. But we need to overcome that. We need to be, if you will, the bigger person to be able to say, or maybe not the bigger person, the smaller person that's able to say, okay, I'm humble. I'm going to do this for you because it's the right thing to do. It's what God wants me to do. And I care about you. Even if you won't care at all, even if you're just going to brush it off, even if you have no respect for me whatsoever, I'm going to act the way that the Lord says that we need to act. In, uh, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. This was the attitude the Apostle Paul had. He says, I will gladly spend, I will spend of my goods and my resources and be spent for you. I will put in the work and the hours. Gladly. Not grudgingly. I'll gladly do this for you. And then he continues on, though, with this thought. He says, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. The more I pour out my heart and do all these things, the less I, I get love back in return. He's, he's saying this is what happens. But he maintains the same attitude. He does it because it's the right thing to do. He does it because it's the spirit of Jesus Christ. Even when, when nobody is going to regard you. When we think about it, we're, we're constantly asking God to give us things, right? Or we should be. I mean, we should be praying to God and asking. And I know that I do. I know I'm always asking for him to help me with things, to teach me, to instruct me, to show me the right way, to help me with health issues, to watch over my family, to do you know, all of these various things that I pray for constantly. I'm always asking God for things. How can we expect to receive things from God if we are unwilling to give anything of ourselves. Do you have that attitude of, of I'll take whatever is given to me, but I'm not willing to give of myself and to give of my things? Look at verse 38 here in Luke chapter 6. Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. So he's saying, you know, hey, if you give, it's going to be given unto you. You don't have to worry about, about the things even that you're giving away. Give and it shall be given unto you. You'll receive just as much as you're given. He said, the same measure that ye meet, that you measure out. That's what that word meet is. The same measure, you know, measuring. They would take scales or whatever. You measure a certain amount of whatever it is that you're, you're giving out. He's saying with the same way, the, the same abundance or lack thereof that you're measuring out and willing to give, he says it's going to be measured to you again. You can give a very little, and guess what? You could expect to receive a, little, a very little. Or you could give a lot and expect to receive a lot. Now, I'm not necessarily, I'm not talking about just like giving money to church here, right? The Bible talks about a tithe. I'm not going to get into the tithe as well as giving. I mean, you could, you could maybe apply a little bit of this to, to like giving money to church, but I'm more talking about what he's referencing here. It's not about the church. It's talking about people who are in need. It's talking about loving your enemies. It's talking about other people and an impact that you can make on their life specifically and individually. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 is a few pages over. We ought to have an attitude about giving where we are truly just trying to be a blessing to others and not hoping for things in return. You know, we don't want to be giving people just to get on their good side. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll you know, like me more and I'll get more things from them because I'm, you know, doing this for them. That is the complete wrong attitude to take. 
when we provide and give unto people. Look at Luke 14, verse number 12. The Bible says, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For, though, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. He's saying if you can, you can, you know, you're making a, a feast or whatever. You know, everyone calls, you know, we have our family birthday parties and stuff and it always just cycles. You're always, you know, hosting a party and going to a party. And it's always just back and forth. And even, you know, people get this way with Christmas time too. It's like, oh, well, They've given me a present, so now I have to give them a present. And, it's not, it's, and it completely destroys this purpose of being able to do things for people, whatever. You know, the point of giving gifts and giving of yourself. We ought to be able to give to people. You know, sometimes people will think, oh, I'm going to give this person a present because then they'll give me something. No, you give people stuff and don't expect to get anything back. And especially he's saying when you can give to the people you know that they can't give anything back to you. You know that they're poor. You know that they're, they're down and out. There is no way they're going to do anything for you because of the situation they're in. The Bible is saying when you can give to those people, hey, you're going to be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. At the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to be something that's added to you that has eternal value, that you were able to help people and be a blessing to people who really and truly were in need. When you can truly just be able to let go of the material possessions, you'll realize the truth that we find in Acts 20. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But in Acts 20, verse 35, the Bible reads, I've showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is a true statement. It is much more blessed to give than to receive. You know, most people think, well, no, it's, I mean, it's better to receive, right? Because then you're just getting more stuff and you have more things and, and you know, it's going to bring you more happiness because you have more stuff. No, that's not the way it works. And if you haven't really given, then you don't know that and understand that. When, but when you're able to part with the material things and not, and not hold that in such high regard. See, when you hold the material things in high regard, then you're going to be thinking it is more blessed to receive because now you got more stuff, right? Because you're valuing the material things so highly. But when you don't value that stuff very highly and you're able to just give it, I mean, when you receive it, okay, yeah, that's nice, it's good. But when you're able to give it to someone, especially someone who's in need, and you can fill a need in this person's life, and really make things a lot better for them because there's something here that they didn't have that they actually needed, that is a true blessing that you receive in helping that person out. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> Look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Very similar to what we just read, you know, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again, right? If, you sow, so if you're just sowing a little bit of seed, well, you can't expect to reap very much. And if you sow bountifully, well, you can expect to reap a lot. Verse 27, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. See, God doesn't want you to have a bitter heart about giving things away. He wants you to be able to be glad about it. And especially when you understand it's more blessed to give than to receive and you can have a good heart and you actually care and love people and say, I'm not going to grudgingly and just, just well, I'm just going to do this because I absolutely have to. He doesn't want that to be the case. He wants you to be able to, to purpose in your heart and love people enough to say, hey, I'm going to give and here's what I'm willing to give. And not because I have to, not because I'm being forced to, but because I want to. And God loves that. If you want to make God happy, the Bible says God loveth a cheerful giver. 
Someone who's happy about doing things for other people and helping them out and giving to them. Verse number 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. See, the Bible's saying that, that you, it's, it's good. I mean, you ought to, there's no reason not to be a cheerful giver and to give and be generous and be able to be a blessing to people. Why should you, why, I mean, why should you hold back from that when you realize that God is able to make all grace abound toward you? That's what he's saying here. That ye always, having all sufficiency, you have what's sufficient for you. Now, it's not saying he's going to just bless you with riches and, you know, and all this stuff amassed. He says, but he'll give you what's sufficient for you, what you need. Because anything above and beyond that, why should you even really care that much about it anyways? And honestly, that's kind of where we all are, are probably at in our life anyways. I, I think, as far as I know, everyone has what's sufficient for them to survive. And more than that. And if you're able to take, even if it's just a little bit, you know, and it's harder the less that you have. It's harder, it could feel harder to give. You'd be like, well, I don't have very much. And you kind of cling to that and you don't want to let go. But he's saying, look, just if, when you find people in need, give it to them. Especially people who can't pay you back. It's a lot easier to give stuff away. Well, I only have this a little bit, but I know if I give it to them, they're going to be able to get it back to me again real soon. You know, I'm not saying not to do that, but where the real blessing is and where the, where the real honor is in God's eyes, it's when you can just give that to somebody and you know they're not getting it back to you. And it's not an issue. Now on the flip side, just as people who do receive things, when you do receive things, you know, you ought to be able to, just be able to receive things as a gift and not feel like you owe anybody anything. But if someone lends you something and it's just borrowed, we ought to do our best to, to pay it back and, and to, to you know, recompense that person. It's the right thing to do. But this is talking about from the giving end, from the giving perspective, we need to be able to just give it and let it go and not, and not have any bitterness in our heart and be able to be generous with things and just give people the stuff. Now, this chapter we saw here in 2 Corinthians 9, we just read a few verses, but this chapter is talking about giving to help other saints also. There's a, there's a collection made for the saints and that they were, they were pulling money together to give to help out other people in need. So it's no surprise that this chapter ends, look at verse number 15, talking about God's gift to us. They were just referring to the, you know, to taking up a collection and to, to being able to, to give um, cheerfully. And then verse 15, he reminds us, he says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You know, as we analyze what we're willing to give up and what we're willing to, do, to give to help other people out, it's always good to remember the unspeakable gift that God has given us. To remember that God has done so much for us in, in, in our salvation and in our life that when you compare anything to that, obviously it pales in comparison. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We even see, though, in Ephesians 4, I'm going to read this for you. Ephesians 4, 28, just one verse out of Ephesians I'm going to read. There's a thief that's admonished to work. You know, there's these, these verses that go through telling people, you know, how, how they ought to do things that are right. In Ephesians 4, 28, the Bible says, let him that stole steal no more. You say, okay, you're a thief. Okay, don't steal anymore, but rather let him labor. So you need to work. You need to stop stealing from people and actually get to work. Working with his hands, the thing which is good. But get this last part. It says that he may have to give to him that needeth. So he's saying, you thief, yeah, you know, you need to get to work. You need to be able to provide for yourself. But not only should you work to provide for yourself, he says, but also you're working with his hands, that which is good, that he may be able to give to him that needeth. So not only does he expect the thief to just work for himself, but to completely turn and be like, okay, I'm now going to be in a position where I can help those other people in need. That's what he really wants, is for you to be able to do all of that. Now, it's not enough, he's saying, just to take care of yourself. The, you need to be able to take care of yourself and then be able to take care of others. 
as, as the goal and, you know, and being able to work and provide for himself and say, okay, now I could also help other people out because they would be in the same position that he was in, right? I mean, if you're stealing, you're probably having a need, most likely. Um, in this way, you can do what's right and be able to help other people that might have been in the same position that you were in. But you're in 1 John chapter 3, and this is important. I want you all to see this in 1 John chapter 3 because we, as a church, as we come together in church, Sarah, I want you to turn around and pay attention, okay? Listen to me. 1 John chapter 3. As a church, we come together. We're here for each other. This is a church family. We look out for each other. We look out for one another. We love one another. And we should be able to be relied upon in our times of need of each other. As Christians, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, hey, of all people, you ought to be able to rely on your church members to help you out. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse number 16. Sarah, hush your mouth and turn around. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 reads, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So what he's saying here is, look, if you have this world's good, if God's blessed you and you have resources, you have finances, you have some other worldly thing that you have, and you see your brother has a need, and you, it says, shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, you don't help them out, even though you have the means to do it, you're fully capable of doing it, you see, you know that they have a need, you know you're capable of doing it, but you decide not to do anything. He says, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He's saying, that's, that's a pretty strong statement. I mean, think about that. If that were you, and you decided, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to help this person out. I know I can, but I'm not going to do it. A brother in Christ, a sister in Christ. He says, how can you say that the love of God dwells in that person? That's why he kind of continues on here in verse 18. You know, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. It's real easy to say, oh yeah, I help people out. I love you, brother. I, you know, I care about you, all this other stuff. He says, but in deed and in truth, because you need to be able to follow it up with actions. It's not enough just for people to hear you say that you love them and you care for them and you're, you're here for them. Hey man, if you have a need, I'm here for you. That does no good whatsoever to say those things if you're not willing to follow it up with deeds and with action and actually do something about it. That is where the love of God dwells, is in those actions and in, in those deeds of doing things. We can hold on to things in this life and hoard things away that may be useful someday. Now, I know I'm completely guilty of this. You go in my workshop, you go in the garage, I've got stuff, I've got so many things that are just like crap and garbage that's just stored away because I think that, you know, one day I might need this for something. And every once in a while, something does come along where it's useful for, but by and large, I don't. But there's nothing wrong with having those things. But see, we don't know what's going to be on the morrow. Now, let's say I have one of these things, you know, I have these, these tools or, you know, hardware or whatever that I put away. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but one day I might use this thing and it'll be great that I have it here. Nothing wrong with that. But let's say someone now has a need. And I remember, you know what, I got this thing. And this is exactly what they need. And this will help them out, you know. I could say, yeah, but you know what, one day I might need that for myself for something. And just, and just shut up my bowels of compassion towards that person and say, yeah, you know what, I, I, might, I might just need that one day. As opposed to saying, well... I don't know if I'm going to need this. I don't know when I'm going to need this. I have no idea. I don't know if I'm going to be dead tomorrow. But I do know that I have this thing and I do know how this person's in need, so I'm going to help them out and I'm going to give it to them. And I'm going to lend it to them. And you know what? I might not even get it back. 
and that's fine. But you know what? I'm going to do that now because if I do have an, and if I don't even get it back, and if I do have a need down the road, I know, I know as much as the Bible is true that God will supply all of my needs. And with the measure that I meet out, it's going to be measured back to me again. So if I can help this person out that has a need right now, and I can help them out and say, hey, God bless you, here you go. If I ever have a need down in the future, it's going to be brought back to me again. God will make sure that those things happen. I don't have to worry about the physical things that we have in this life and hold on to them so tightly. When people have a need, we can give to them. We see the same spirit that we saw in Luke chapter 6. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. It's the last place we're going to turn tonight. Romans chapter 12. The same spirit and a lot of the same phrases and ideas are going to be repeated here in Romans chapter 12. Now, I'm just going to admonish you, when you do read the Bible, the more times that you see things mentioned, the more important they are, the more God's trying to tell you, hey, this is important. Pay attention to this. And these things, I know what we read in Luke chapter 6 is not news to anybody in here. I don't think this is the first time you've heard that, that being taught and loving your enemies and doing these things because it's not just in that one chapter. It's found in the other Gospels as well as it's found here in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, let's start reading in verse number 9. The Bible reads, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Dissimulation. Basically, don't let your love be fake. It should be real. And not just in word or in, in tongue, right? As the Bible said earlier. But in deed and in truth. And in, and in you being able and willing to do things on and act on it. That is love without dissimulation. Verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. So what he's saying here, again, it's a humble attitude that we need to have being Kindly affection toward each other with brotherly love as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to love each other and in honor preferring one another. So basically, everyone should be putting the other people above themselves and treating them as being very important. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. This is the way that you ought to be. But you can't take these things and say, well, this person's slothful in business, so I'm not going to help them. No, you need to be not slothful. You need to be fervent. But don't hold all these things against other people when you can be kindly and affection toward them and, and helping with them. Verse number 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Verse 13, look at this distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. The saints, other believers, believers in Christ, especially church members that come here, we need to be able to distribute to the necessity of the saints. That's what the early church did in the book of Acts. You remember when people would sell their possessions and they would bring the money uh, that they got from, from selling what they had and the, the money, the the what they got was distributed according as every man had need. So the people in their group, the brothers and sisters in Christ that were with them, those that were in need, when, when other people who had wealth, who had this world's good, brought their stuff and said, hey, here we go, I want to help people out, then they were able to distribute it to the people who actually had need. That was an act. And we see that here also, being able to distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Hospitality is taking care of people, right? Being hospitable, being able to feed them, being able to help clothe them, whatever the case may be, inviting them into your house. Verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. This is the attitude we need to take. It's not the attitude of the world. But when people curse you, go ahead and bless them. And sometimes it's difficult. I remember one time when Brother Sebastian and I were out soul winning and some lady's like cursing us out. And the only thing I got to say is it's like, well, have a good day or bless you or whatever. You know, whatever. I don't even remember exactly what it was I said. But what your flesh wants to say is different than what you actually should say and the way you actually should be. You know, bless the person. Say, you know what? Fine. Someone comes, you're out soul winning and they just want to 
tear into you and tell you how stupid you are and tell you how they're going to call the cops and they're going to do all this other stuff, bless that person. Go ahead. They can curse you out all they want, but you don't need to stoop down to their level and just start cursing back. Verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So we see here the same concept, but just a little bit more information is added there, right? He's saying, look, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. You know, bless them that curse you. Do all these good things to people that are not doing good things to you. And he, he adds this little phrase at the end, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Why? Because God is the one that recompenses. God is the one that will get revenge for you. You don't have to right every wrong. You just need to do what's right. God is in the business of judging people God sees what happens. God can see you doing what's right. And the more that you are doing good for other people, and if they're hating you even more, guess what? That is just adding more judgment upon them on their own heads, and they're doing it. And God is going to be the one to bring that judgment on them. It, it should not come from you. Let them get judged of God. You just do what God has instructed you to do. And that's to do the right thing, to bless them that, that, that hate you, and to do all these other things. And ultimately, this is where I was getting to earlier in verse 21, there at the end, last verse. He says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't let the evil get the best of you. The way that you fight the evil is with good. We overcome that evil by doing good. So when the people are bad mouthing you, do all these things, hey, just do good to, co to overcompensate for the bad that they're doing towards you. And it makes sense. I mean, when you really sit down and think about it, it makes sense. Because if someone's doing bad to you and poorly to you, you're just going to perpetuate this war, this battle, if you bring the battle to them. Say, okay, well, now I'm going to be bad. You know, and, and it doesn't even matter who starts it because then it's just going to perpetuate until someone can humble themselves and forgive the other person. You know, but we ought to be able to do that, is what he's saying here, before it even starts. Or as it gets started, just forgive them and, and bless them and do good for them or whatever. And don't let it escalate because all that's going to possibly happen is they, they'll either, one, continue to do bad unto you, and the more you do good to them, they're just heaping coals of fire on their own head. In so doing, we can take comfort in that. Or you can stop the whole situation together and actually get them to maybe realize, wow, I can't believe I'm doing this. If they humble themselves and say, wow, what a jerk I'm being when this person is actually just doing good for me. They don't have it out for me. You can actually win people's hearts. You can actually win people to Christ with this type of an attitude. Because that's different. That's going to stand out. That's different from the world. So in closing, we just, you know, as, as church members, we ought to be able to, not just as church members, but as people, we need to have the right attitude on our lives, on the things that we possess, and on the people that are, that are brothers and sisters in Christ especially. We need to be able to realize that people aren't going to treat us right. People won't treat us with the respect that we deserve, maybe. People are going to do bad things to us, but we need to have the attitude that Christ instructed us to have. Not the easy one to have, but the one He instructed us to have. To have the love of God in us, and when somebody is in need of something, be able to provide that need for them. And know that, that God has a reward for us when we do those things. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words. Dear Lord, we need this instruction. We, we, need, we need to 
be told by you that, that this is the way we are supposed to act because everything in our flesh is going to tell us to do the opposite. We thank you for loving us enough to tell us this great truth. And God, I pray that you would please strengthen us and help us to have a, a humble heart that's, that's willing to do these things and, and put them into practice, dear Lord, and not just to love in, in word or with our tongue, but actually indeed in, in, in truth, dear Lord, that we'd be able to, to act on the things that we ought to act on in, in providing um, when people have need, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.